Hey, 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 alrighty. Some of what I'm gonna tell you in this lecture will overlap with things you're gonna learn in the textbook, but I'm gonna put my own little twist on some of them. Plus there's a video I always just have to show here because it makes me smile and we need everything that makes us smile nowadays. So we'll, we'll get there very soon. Uh, what we're gonna focus on here though is the issue of the development of language and you know something really important that was revealed by the way that language develops. Okay, so let's kind of jump into that and let's just start right here. Um, first of all, just a, a few um, sort of things that happen along the path as, as um, a young infant is starting to interact with language. So we're being very young here, but the point that I'm, we're going to make in this video is look what's happening in those young times. So I would like you, as we do this, to, to go back to social limitation theory, Bandura. Uh, and you remember when I said, you know, there's classical conditioning and all that, uh, operant conditioning, um, but maybe the first most powerful form of learning is in fact social limitation. Uh, and then we're going to see a little bit of that here. So this infant is born into a world. It's born into, a, well, even before it's born into a world, by the way, um, uh, while it's still literally within its mother, it's hearing sounds and it's hearing speech sounds. And it in fact knows its mother's voice and its father's voice when it's born, um, it will orient. If it hears two males speaking or two females speaking, it will or always orient towards the voice of its parents. And so it recognizes the voice of its parents at the day of birth. But that doesn't mean that's a nature thing. In fact, most people don't think it's a nature thing. They literally think that while it's in the womb, it's hearing these voices outside. So it's spending months being surrounded by especially those two voices. And at the day of its birth, it knows those voices already. It's already been learning uh, in the womb uh, what those voices sound like. Okay, by about nine months, we know that it can distinguish between speech and non-speech sounds. Now, by the way, how do you know that with a baby, especially one that can't speak? Like, how do you know it knows the difference? You, you'll have a whole chapter next class uh, on developmental psychology. In fact, Kyle, uh, your teacher, is an expert on developmental psychology, so he'll certainly tell you a lot about uh, the details of development. But, you know, what we do with things like this is, is we give the child um, exposure to different sounds, um, some that are speech and some that are non. And what we will notice again is that it will tend to attend more to one or the other. Um, usually it'll attend more to the speech sounds. You'll see like if a speech sound is over here and a non-speech sound is over there, you play them both at the same time, it'll tend to orient towards the speech sounds consistently. And the fact that it's doing it consistently at nine months tells you that it can tell the difference between those. It has already has learned that speech is a very important um, stimulus to attend to. Okay. Um, interestingly, and the textbook talks about this in, in a little bit of detail, and there's a video there that kind of brings it to life a little bit, depending on the language, depending on the culture that the child is born into, certain sounds are important. And so there's a there's the video about, uh, I believe it's Korean again, where it talks about how it's what's called a tonal language. So they inflect the pitch of words as they say it. So some words will go up, some words will go down. Uh, and that word going up or the word going down means something to them. It does to us as well, but English is not nearly as tonal. We use tonal for other things like you can usually tell when someone's asking you a question because they go up at the end. Not always, but usually it's like, do you want to go out tonight? Can I borrow the car? And we kind of lift at the end. So often we'll use a tone to, to indicate we're asking a question, for example. But as you'll see in that video, sometimes little words can indicate stuff. But here's the interesting thing. <clears throat> when you're born, you're ready for everything. But if you grow up in a culture where a certain distinction isn't important, then you stop hearing it. You, you don't notice that distinction anymore. So literally our uh, language listening abilities are being tailored and sounds that aren't part of our language culture disappear. This is why, by the way, we will see um, the example you sometimes notice is in Japanese children where the L and the R sounds are very similar, virtually similar. And so when they're speaking English, they sometimes have trouble with that distinction. So if a word was like, um, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to the, I'm at the end of my rope. 
that might be an English phrase. I'm at the end of my rope. Uh, a Japanese person trying to say that might say, I'm at the end of my lope. And they might have an L where there should be an R, or they might put an R where there should be an L, because to them, they, they can't notice the difference. Um, my example of this is, is I traveled to Italy, and I had two friends with me. And between us, we spoke French, English, German, and Dutch. Um, in Italy, that doesn't matter. They speak Italian. <laughs> and so despite us having four languages, we could not uh, converse uh, with the Italians, uh, not at least in any normal way. And so uh, we didn't have a lot of money. Every morning we would get a loaf of bread and we would live off that for a little while. Uh, but how do you order a loaf of bread? Well, the first time we went into a, we went into a bakery and I kind of pantomime, cut it in, put butter on it, eat it. And the person's like, oh, penna. I'm like, oh, penna. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And we get the bread. And the next time I go back and I go penna and the person's like, I said, penna. And they're like, and I'm like, and they're like, oh, penna. And I'm like, it's not what I just said. But it wasn't what I just said. You know, four days in a row, I could not get that word right because there was something they were saying that I couldn't hear because it's something, it's a sound that's important in Italian that isn't important in English. Uh, and, and I couldn't even hear it anymore. Okay, so that's an example. So the, the system is being tuned a little bit. By about eight to 10 months, this is when they're starting to understand some words. So they're getting a little bit like that dog you saw the video of where they're getting individual words um, that are associated with various things. So they might say apple when they want an apple. And so they're kind of like, you know, this is the point where a lot of animals reach. But it's really what, what's starting to happen at this period um, that goes above and beyond what any animal can do. That's kind of cool. So let me show you this uh, and get ready to smile. Get ready to smile. So here's what I want. It's cute, right? So these are two twins. How old are they? Uh, just over a year, I would suggest, by them standing up. Maybe 18 months, something like that. But I would guess more like 12 to 14 months. Here's the cool thing. They are what we call babbling. They're not using words. But they're kind of, well, yeah, we have the subtitles. <laughs> Somebody thinks they're using words, and those are the words they're using. And so that's some smart ass putting those words down to make it funny. And it is funny. But here's... Here's the thing that's cool. It seems like they're using words. Why? They're using grammar and they're using turn taking and they're using inflection. You know, it feels like they, they made that last one a question here. The reason they made it a question is because it sounded like a question. Listen. See, want to listen, right? Yeah. That's how we ask a question. Uh, and so that, that's why the person interpreted it as a question. And they're, they're turn-taking in the sense that one talks. And then the other talks. Social imitation going on there. Emotional reaction that they've seen. So this is all, this, you know, imagine them, look, look at the hand. Yeah. Imagine them looking at adults having a conversation. This is what they're seeing. That's what they're hearing too. Blah, 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 blah. They don't know the words. But the fact that they're seeing this little play play out so often, they're now ready to do this. So this is, I'll let you watch more if you want later. But this is a sign that they're already starting to learn things like the structure of sentences and, and, and the turn taking you take when you're communicating in this kind of complex way, a complex way that animals just do not communicate. So before they even have the words to use, they're already learning the dance of a, of a conversation, um, which is kind of fascinating. Right. And, and that is when, when this said sort of 12, four to 10 months, you know, they're a little further than 10 months, 
um, but but um, you know that's what you're seeing right there and I you know for me that's fascinating it shows you social limitation theory um, so clearly um, but it also kind of tells you about their language development that at the same time they're just starting to pick up words they're also picking up the whole ritual of a conversation uh, and, and they've already got that sort of embodied Okay. This will be part of where you're going to read about this nature versus nurture controversy around language um, and, and some of the um, ideas of Noam Chomsky that some of our language things may be hardwired, may be innate, um, may even be culturally invariant. They may reflect something we all, we're all possessed with at born, when we're born, which is a really interesting idea. But that's some of the evidence. It seems like these kids have this stuff so young. They're so ready to get language. Okay. So let's just talk um, generally. Let's just give you some of these milestones as we go through. So you get a sense here, for example, they start babbling at about six, um, some six months, that is. Somewhere around seven months, they understand the word no. They don't like it very much, but they understand that no means, you know, not to do something, to, to stop doing something. Um, and so they get that sense of what the word no means very early on. One of the first words they learn other than maybe mommy and daddy, maybe, um, no is next. That's kind of scary, huh? Um, they can follow a one step command. They can, so you kind of just see things kind of go up here. Speaks the first real word around a year, speaks four to six words about three months later, 10 to 15 words a little bit after that makes two word sentences and it's right around here where it starts to go boom so for example if you look at 16 month old 18 months old and then you look at the language you see it really start to go up now i wanted just to bring in a little bit of psychology and to connect some things again to get you thinking about this this is um, a study it's more of a correlational study but it's looking at how many words a child learns uh, in its first three years in this case as a function of what we call the socioeconomic status of its parents. Um, are its parents professionals, doctors, lawyers, professors, that kind of thing? Um, are the kids' parents working class parents um, or are they welfare parents? And what you see here is um, the number of words the kid learns depends on the occupation of their parents. What does that mean? Why? So this is always fun. And in class, I usually throw this out there and, and it's really nice to get people theorizing and coming up with hypotheses and all that kind of stuff because that's what data like this does, right? It makes us think about some of the things. And there are a number of ways of, of thinking about this. You know, some people say, well, maybe those people who go on to become professionals had some genetic advantage. They were already more intelligent somehow and that's why they became professionals and that's why their kids are also learning better. So it could be a genetic thing. You can see it that way. Um, an another way of imagining it is that professional parents probably read more. They probably have a bigger vocabulary themselves. So when they speak to one another, they probably use more words and therefore the child is being exposed to more words. Uh, more variability of words, and therefore they pick up more. It's literally the richness of their environment that they're modeling. Um, whereas perhaps, you know, children with working class parents or welfare parents, perhaps there isn't uh, the, the same sophistication use of language. It may also be the case that maybe welfare parents are more likely to be, you know, working moms or something who are, who are just so frazzled they don't spend as much time you know working with their kids or say reading to their kids as maybe a professional parent does so all of these things there could be genetic factors there could be an environmental factors about the language that's around them it could be attentional like how the parenting styles how much is the parent able to be with them but clearly what this shows is that your language development you know is is a function partly of of your your position in life, where you're born, um, and how that kind of arises. So just something to keep in mind. Okay, here's the other thing, and, and, and I'm sure the textbook's gonna talk about this in more detail. So we may come back to it, but I wanna introduce it to you, especially because so many of you are multilingual. I think you probably have experienced something like this before. Um, and so let me, let, we'll come back to this one. Let me jump to Jeannie. So this story of Jeannie is one of the real sad stories in psychology. Uh, Jeannie was uh, from basically not long after birth locked into a closet. Uh, her parents pretended she didn't exist. 
uh, they kept her separated from everything. Uh, so they would feed her, they would take care of her toiletry needs, but she grew up in a closet until she was discovered at 13 years old. So at 13 years old, she'd had no social interactions with anybody other than her parents. And even those interactions were extremely minimal. They basically treated her like an animal. Um, when she was found at 13, people were like, oh, this is horrible. We have to, you know, help her to live as normal a life as possible. And, you know, one of the things they realized is, is that she couldn't speak. She didn't have any language abilities. Uh, and they thought, well, okay, that's one thing we can work on. That, that shouldn't be too hard to get her to a place where she can speak. Turned out it was very, very hard. Um, she had a hard time learning language, which was kind of curious at some point because we know that children can learn language so quickly. But that brought up this idea of what we now call a critical period. And the idea of this is, it seems as though the brain is really ready to learn language at a certain point. And that point is sort of, you know, two to six, seven, eight years old, somewhere in there, um, that if a child is exposed to language or a second language, they can learn it so fast, like amazingly quick. Uh, and so, you know, imagine if you say traveled to a different culture with your parents and that different culture had a different language. If you were at that young age, you can probably now speak that language almost as good as a local person can. How are your parents doing? What you find is when you look at people picking up a second language and say, this is how proficient a native speaker that language is. If that child learns somewhere in their three to seven year, if they're exposed to that language sometime between when they're three and seven, they end up speaking that language as well as a native speaker. Now, the longer they wait, if they're eight to 10 years old before they get exposed, ah, they never quite make it to the same level of proficiency. 11 to 15, this is where Jeannie was. Worse still. 17 to 39, me. <laughs> here. Um, so the idea here is once you get outside of that critical period, your brain isn't necessarily ready to learn a new language anymore. Uh, and so it's a lot harder. You have to learn it a lot more consciously. You can't just be exposed to it. Um, and, and that started to suggest maybe this is how the brain develops. Maybe there's certain periods of time when it's ready to process a certain kind of stimulus and become really proficient with it. But if it doesn't get that stimulus during that time, then you've got Genie. Uh, you got somebody who's going to have a very hard time ever being able to do it, even though it would have been so easy during that period brought in this whole idea of critical periods. Okay, so just a few things for you guys to think about in the development of language as you go through this chapter. I will see you again in a subsequent lecture. Bye-bye.